Hi there, welcome to my video on involuntary manslaughter. So I've just put the two types of involuntary manslaughter together um, just to make it a bit more straightforward. So let's first focus on UDAM. Now the actual name of the crime is unlawful act manslaughter. So why the acronym UDAM? Well, what it's there for is to put in a very, very important element to help you remember it in your revision. I'll explain it as I go through. So the first thing that we would do is talk about our introductory paragraph and explain a little bit about what involuntary manslaughter means. Essentially, what we have is the defendant has committed the actus reus of murder, but not the mens rea. So they have caused the unlawful killing of a human being under the Queen's peace. But when they did that, they didn't intend to kill, they didn't intend to cause serious harm, and they didn't have oblique intent either. So it wasn't a virtual certainty and they didn't realise that. What that means is they don't get a mandatory life sentence. They can get up to life. That's discretionary. So they can get up to a life sentence, but that's at the discretion of a judge still. So we've caused a person's death, but without that mens rea. Now, it might be that you meant to cause some harm, but not serious harm. And I've put some typical examples of the sort of um, root of crimes that you might find. So arson, battery, robbery, or the supply of drugs. So people have um, done these things which have led to someone's death but in none of those do we have the intent to cause serious harm. So essentially what we're looking at now is whether we can construct a manslaughter charge from those offences. That's why you'll sometimes see this called constructive manslaughter. It's the same crime. So we have a root crime that we construct manslaughter out of. The prosecution must show four elements for unlawful act manslaughter. The first, clearly, is an unlawful act. And I've just broken that down into two elements that are quite straightforward. So by unlawful, now unlawful can mean a range of things, but we are referring to crimes here. So what that means is no torts will allow. So for example, you can't have uh, unlawful act manslaughter come from negligence, nuisance, occupier's liability, um, defamation, it would have to be from a crime. And again, you can see some examples of crimes quite clearly there. The next word is key. It's in the definition, unlawful act manslaughter. It must be an action, not an omission. So if it's a failure to act, that can't be this crime. Although, see gross negligence manslaughter, which we'll look at in just a moment. The second element, which is the D I referred to before, is that it's not enough for it to be an unlawful act. It must be dangerous. And what I want us to get into the habit of not just saying it has to be dangerous, but it has to be dangerous according to the church test. So it needs to come out just as one long sentence now. So from now on, whenever you're talking about something being dangerous, we're questioning whether it's dangerous according to the church test. So what do we mean by that? The church test is objective. That means it asks whether the reasonable person would have foreseen a risk of some harm happening from your actions. So, for example, it's unlikely that fraud would fall in at number two. Now, fraud is an unlawful action, uh, trying to cheat people out of money, but it's unlikely to be dangerous. A reasonable person wouldn't foresee the risk of some harm happening from fraud. But hopefully you can see from some of the cases that have been recognised that an objective, reasonable person might foresee the risk of some harm happening. So, for example, in JM and SM, they got into a fight with bouncers. The bouncer had a heart attack. Now, that was very unusual. Um, he had sort of no real prior history of, uh, of heart failure. But would a reasonable person foresee a risk of some harm from a fight? Of course. Therefore, it fit in here. Or what about fire? So it doesn't have to necessarily be aimed at a person. In the case of Goodfellow, he burnt down the council house he was living in to try and get into a better one out of the area. He never meant to hurt anybody. That was very, very clear. However, a reasonable person would foresee the risk of some harm happening if he set house on fire. Finally, burglary. Now, you'll learn more about burglary when we do property offences, but... Burglary doesn't necessarily have to have a risk of any harm to somebody. 
essentially burglary is theft while you're trespassing. So you don't always see the risk of some harm. However, if you very purposefully target an elderly victim's home, then a reasonable person might foresee the risk of some harm. And that's what was decided in the case of Watson. Also, if you have risky getaways, um, in the case of Bristol, they, they tried to get away through a very, very narrow road and they ran over the, the homeowner. I suppose in those circumstances, the reasonable person would have foreseen the risk of some harm as well. So it doesn't matter if the defendant foresaw the risk of any harm. So for example, in the case of Goodfellow, he could argue that he never meant to hurt anybody in the fire. He never thought anybody would end up in the fire. That doesn't matter as long as the reasonable person would have. Then that unlawful dangerous action must have led to the victim's death. And, and this is a straightforward case of showing factual and legal causation. So just to remind you very, very quickly, same as ever, factual requires the but for test and a chain of causation to be complete. And that's the real key here. And then it's got to be not remote and we also look at the thin skull rule. Oh, very, very quick in there. So those are the four elements of causation. Factual, but four in the chain of causation. And then we look at legally whether you should be responsible, the, the test of remoteness and the thin skull rule or the eggshell skull rule. So the unlawful action must have led to the victim's death. Now, one of the big questions around this is the culpability or the blameworthiness of drug dealers. This boils down to a really important question. Did you actually physically administer the drugs to the victim or did you just hand over the drugs which the victim took themselves? So, for example, in Cato, they administered the drugs to each other. The defendant actually put the syringe into the victim. In this case, we do have a clear chain of causation. So him administering the drugs clearly led to the victim dying. However, if you just supply the drugs, and we saw this in the case of Dolby and Kennedy, where they prepare the syringe, but then hand it over to the victim, when the victim injects or takes the drugs themselves, they break the chain of causation. That's because a chain of causation can be broken by an unforeseeable, unreasonable action of a victim themselves. Now, if a person chooses of their own free will to take drugs, that is an unreasonable action they've chosen to do themselves. So they will have broken the chain of causation and therefore the victim is responsible for their own death. Now we have seen a little bit of a loophole in this um, start to appear and we can see gross negligence manslaughter step in. So for example, if a person takes drugs that have been um, supplied by the defendant and that person is clearly in uh, a lot of distress so for example there are signs of overdose if the defendant then fails to get medical help that might be an omission for gross negligence manslaughter and we'll talk more about that in a bit finally mens rea what is the mens rea for unlawful act manslaughter well it's very simple all we need is the mens rea for whatever the crime is in number one so for example, you might need the mens rea for arson or the mens rea for battery or the mens rea for robbery or the mens rea for supplying of drugs. Now that's a very low threshold. And remember, there is no need for the defendant to have intended or foreseen or thought about or even be reckless about death occurring. We don't have to show it ever crossed their mind. And we saw that in DPP versus Newbury and Jones. The boys threw a... Um, a concrete slab onto onto the bridge from a bridge onto the um the train tracks below and killed the, the train driver they never foresaw the risk of any harm from that uh, or any death from that it didn't matter did they intend criminal damage yes so all we need is the mens rea for the root of crime so for example if we go back to the case of goodfellow where he set his house on fire did he intend arson? Did he intend criminal damage by fire? Yes. Was it an unlawful act? Yes. Was it dangerous according to the church test? Yes. And did it actually lead to people dying? Yes. 
therefore he was convicted. So hopefully that makes sense. Now remember, the key is that it's an unlawful act. The minute we don't have an unlawful act, we should switch to thinking about gross negligence manslaughter. All right, so you're probably gonna get a question on both of these together. So you may just want to do the same introduction or just carry on. The introduction is the same as what we've just gone through. Remember, this is where we've caused the unlawful death of a human being under the Queen's peace, but we never intended to kill or cause serious harm. But we were maybe negligent in our actions, which led to that death. So there are three key elements, and these are very, very sim uh, similar to civil negligence. So if you can remember negligence, you can remember gross negligence manslaughter. So first off, we've got to owe the victim a duty of care. How do we decide that? When is a duty of care owed? Well, we generally use the civil negligence rules and most importantly, the special duties that we owe for an omission or a failure to act. So remember, we don't have a good Samaritan law. We don't have to help everybody all the time. We only owe a duty of care in certain situations. So for example, if you have a special duty or a statutory duty to help. So for example, if you're a police officer, if you have a contractual duty. So for example, if you're a lifeguard and you fail to um, help someone in your pool drowning and they die, that could be gross negligence manslaughter. You had a contractual duty to save them and you failed to act. The other one, which I've rubbed off a little bit there, is where you caused the danger in the first place. So you might remember the case of R versus Miller where he fell asleep having a cigarette and then moved to another room. Now, if someone had died in that fire, that could have been gross negligence manslaughter. Now, in the case of Evans, this is where the drugs issue came up. So in Evans, um, the defendant gave her half-sister drugs and she overdosed. Now, remember the half-sister took the drugs so it's not unlawful at manslaughter because she took the drugs herself. However, the, the mother and, and the half-sister, they both decided not to ring for um, medical attention because they were worried the supplier would get in trouble. So the victim died. She was found guilty of gross negligence manslaughter because she'd caused the danger in the first place by supplying the drugs. So if a drug dealer sees a client overdosing and then leaves, it won't be unlawful at manslaughter because if they've taken them themselves, but it might be gross negligence manslaughter for failing to get help when they cause the danger in the first place. It might be that there is a special relationship like parent and child. So remember Stone and Dobinson? That would be a case of involuntary manslaughter and where you've um, volunteered to look after someone. So again, Stone and Dobinson, Gibbons and Proctor, those are cases of gross negligence manslaughter. They should have acted, they didn't, a person died. The next one, and this is really key, is that it's not enough for it to be negligence. Remember, it's not called negligence manslaughter, it has to be gross. Now, gross means very bad, very serious, very severe. So, a breach is where you fall below the expected standard of care. And that's essentially the mens rea for gross negligence manslaughter. You didn't intend any harm, you weren't reckless, but you were negligent. You, your actions fell below what we would expect of a doctor, for example. However, it has to be gross. How do we decide? Gross means that it's so bad, we think it should be criminal. How do we decide if it's so bad it should be criminal? Well, it'll be gross. How do we decide if it's gross? but so bad it's criminal. This is called a circular test. And this is a very big criticism of gross negligence manslaughter that should appear in all your essays. It's just a circle that goes round and round. We don't have a very clear essence or direction for juries. But if you remember the case of Adam Mirko, um, he, he took something like nine minutes um, to notice that the tip, um, anesthetic tube had been disconnected. Most reasonable doctors would notice in 15 seconds. So that clearly is so bad, it should be criminal. And therefore that was not just negligence, it was gross negligence. So juries just have to use this. And this is why we have 12 ordinary members of the public. Those 12 people would have to decide if it's gross. Does it feel not just a mistake, but such a bad mistake that it should be classed as criminal? 
finally, just like in Gross, uh, sorry, Unlawful Act of Manslaughter, the breach must have caused the victim's death. And that's again just shown through factual and legal causation. So the but for test is satisfied and there's a clear chain between their failure to act and the death. It's not too remote and anything school rule issues would have to take into account. Remember, if you argue gross negligence manslaughter, then it could be a life sentence or it could be any other sentence the judge deems appropriate. Thanks for listening.